then I'm going to start sharing my screen now. Let's make sure I do the right thing here. <clears throat> and do people watching have the option to go to full screen mode or is that something everybody controls on their own or? It should go to full screen mode as soon as you're sharing the screen, I think. Okay. Well, anyway, does it look all right? Does, can everybody see the picture of full screen? Yeah, looks good. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Louis Joel. Um, I, I think it's a, a great idea for an exhibition combining art and nature and the environment. I'm going to speak on behalf of the Hobson's Bay Wetlands Center. I entered an artwork in the exhibit and um, I'm going to talk about, it's a, it's a salt marsh painting. I'm going to talk about salt marsh. I'm going to try to cover those things, art, the environment, nature, and work them all into, into one talk. We'll see how that goes. Um, so my painting is called Puddles in Salt Marsh. Um, this is it. I showed it to my parents. They said they liked it. They said we could tell that it's plants. And uh, yes, it's plants. I showed it to another friend said, oh, it's a great work. I love that painting. It's another planet, right? No, it's not. It's a real place. It's real plants. This is what they look like in real life. Um, it's called Salicornia quincaflora or beaded glassworth, that's the name of the species. Obviously a really strange plant. It's got absolutely no leaves. It's a succulent, really short and wiggly. Um, can be really bright green. Can also decide to be really red. Can also decide to be really dead or half dead. Um, sometimes the parts of the plant just die or else what happens here is they lose their succulents. But anyway, from an artist's point of view, that's just lots of great colors to, uh, to mix together, which is really all I wanted to do, to mix together. Um, well, particularly red and green, as you know, are complementary colors. So when you brush together complementary colors, lots of fun things happen. So that's the story behind the painting, um, which was lots of fun. But it gives me an excuse to talk about something really important, which is salt marsh. And um, as I said, I'm going to talk about art and science and nature. Didn't know what to say about art and salt marsh. I was going to say that it's actually really underappreciated. There aren't a lot of artists who focus on salt marsh. But then um, I'm part of the Hobson's Bay Wetlands Center, a really high percentage of the people in that group are artists. So um, maybe I should just talk for myself. I myself never really appreciated the salt marsh. Um, I love the Australian bush, lived really close to Laverton Creek for years, but no, I didn't really appreciate it. It's, um, you know, it's just this short, scrubby, weedy, almost unnoticeable stuff, but, um, the Hobson's Bay Wetland Center helped me to see the light. Um, and uh, now I've been involved with it for a couple of years and actually starting to really see the salt marsh. I was involved when we were, this is our logo for the Hobson's Bay Wetland Center. I was involved when we were talking about it and I said, we should put some of that stuff in the logo, some of that plant that grows in the salt marsh. And Chris Rockley, who designed this logo, she knew because she's a scientific illustrator. And now I know too, this plant here in our logo, that's beaded glasswort. Um, speaking of Chris, Chris really does have a great appreciation of nature, always had, and also is really good at getting other people to appreciate. So these are pictures from one of her workshops where she actually got artists out into the salt marsh which I think is a, a great thing. So I wanna use this talk to do the same thing as Chris does to encourage you people, encourage anybody to get out there and explore the salt marsh. If you're an artist, take your sketch pad, just take your artistic eye 
Um, if you are a photographer, take your camera. Um, the salt marsh is a great place for photography. You can probably take much better pictures than I do, and then you can share them with me and with others. And uh, I want to thank Alan Williams, a local Altona photographer, for sharing this picture of the um, sharp-tailed sandpipers with me. If you get out into the local salt marsh areas, we have plenty of them in Hobson's Bay, you'll find that uh, the place of amazing colors, um, really interesting plants. And I also want to say that salt marsh and also the estuaries and the coastal sand spits, places where you find salt marsh, are <clears throat> some of our most amazing landscapes for natural forms and patterns. And they may be not that easy to see from the ground. So I'm gonna encourage you to explore them from above, which probably doesn't really sound like proper exploring, but you can do it easily like in Google Earth, which is what we're doing here. Google Maps is just as good. And it does count as exploring in my book because I th I'm just really big on it. I think it's really important to have this view of the landscape. Uh, so for example, here we're exploring the coastal salt marsh near Queenscliff. And this one here, this is Corner Inlet in Gippsland, which I just think is amazing. You know, I went looking for pictures on Google Earth and Google Earth is like an artwork generator. Um, like these pictures of coastal salt marsh, they could just as easily be really brilliant abstract paintings. And in actual fact, I'm, I'm just kidding because the one on the right is an abstract painting. What we have here is we have Western Port Bay, Flinders Island, and John Olson. And I threw it in because I'm trying to tie everything to art, but uh, John Olson, really well-known artist, spent his entire career really fascinated with the way Australian wetlands look from above, from the air. And it's, it's not just John Olson, it's like in my lifetime, I've seen that this whole idea of looking at the earth from space or from the air has had a huge impact on all of us and really particularly on artists to the point where now we have landscape artists flying their own airplanes, which isn't something that we all can do, um, or operating drones or just going on Google Earth for inspiration, which is something that we all can do. I'm gonna make a special shout out here to Wayne Famiri. It's a perfect example. Wayne's a really well-known filmmaker who lives right here in Altona. And he appreciates landscape and he uses these techniques. And this is a still from a really great video that he did of our local Altona salt marsh, um, which you can see properly by going to vimeo.com, search for Hobson's Bay Wetland Center. So, I just, I'm throwing it in. I think the view from above is also a really important um, way of properly seeing the salt marsh. Switching over to talk about some science now, but really briefly, um, coastal salt marsh, an ecosystem found wherever you have flooding and high salt levels, which obviously happens in flat spots um, around high tide, low tide, but also can happen um, where you have areas flooding from fresh water, but there's a lot of salt in the soil. And this habitat is just so important. Uh, really could have a really long talk just on that. But uh, it is important in its own right and also protects other habitats. It protects the land from the sea and the sea from the land. Um, and the salt marsh that we have in Hobson's Bay is actually of international significance. It's actually on the list of um, wetlands that's maintained by UNESCO, um, the Ramsar list of internationally significant wetlands that need to be preserved because they're so important. Around the world, there's a few general, basic general types of salt marsh. If you're at if you're in the tropics or in the subtropics, that ecological niche is going to be um, filled by mangroves. They'll dominate that uh, salt marsh um, situation. 
in other parts of the world, you have salt marsh that looks like this, grassy salt marsh, which is really a lot of people's stereotypical view of what salt marsh is, including a lot of people in Australia, and even including a lot of people who should know better, because this is not what we have in Australia. I can understand, you know, there could be some confusion about that because we have lots of places with landscapes like this, including in Hobson's Bay. This is a really huge field of Gania Phelum in Altona Meadows. So you can see we do have grasses and sedges and rushes that grow in our salt marsh, but this is different. This is, uh, Gania Phelum doesn't grow at the water's edge because it couldn't. It couldn't survive the daily flooding of seawater. But every coastal ecosystem needs at, at least one species that can grow at the water's edge. It just takes one species that uh, will put up their hand and say, yes, we will do that. We will take that on for the good of the community. And in Australia and a lot of places around the world, that is glasswort. So it's in Australia, it's this species in particular, Salicornia quinquiflora, beaded glasswort. It's the only thing we have other than mangroves that can survive flooding twice a day with seawater. So that means it becomes the foundation. If it can grow, other things can grow later. And it does that all the way around the continent of Australia <clears throat> in our salt marsh. This species is the foundation. So it makes it one of the most important plants in Australia. This is just, I'm going to give you a few fun facts about glasswort. Where did the name come from? Well, wart is uh, an old English word that just means weed, um, which tells us that this plant was named during the Middle Ages. So um, this plant's been known for a long time to Europeans because it had great economic significance in the Middle Ages. This is, um, glasswort is a key ingredient in making glass. So um, because England had better glasswort habitat than other parts of Europe, it enabled English towns to become the leaders in the medieval glass economy. Um, another thing that people, people find interesting is that glasswort is edible and it's been edible, it's been eaten for a long time. Um, and a lot of people ask when we have these talks, because they've heard that, is glasswort edible? Yes, it is. I'm going to introduce you to another plant, which is also growing in the salt marsh, really a really hardy plant, which can't quite take the flooding that uh, the glasswort does, but um, almost, it lives just at the high tide line and uh, lives on jetties and the edges of beaches. And its uh, common name is sea blight, would you believe? Which tells us that this plant was named by pirates, maybe, um, or maybe not, I don't know, just kidding. But I have, uh, I have my own name for it. I call it rainbow plant because, uh, I mean, that's, that's not a thing, that's just my name. But I'm amazed at how variable and how colorful this plant can be. So you could be out in the salt marsh, think that you're looking at five different species of plant um, and it's all, it's all sea blight. Um, it comes in red, green, pink, purple, aqua blue, and it's even more colorful in the autumn as is the, uh, the salicornia as well. So it means that our coastal salt marsh actually has fall colors, which is a, a, really, um, a really important hint to photographers. Uh, and uh, you can go out in the fall and, and find the, the huge variety of colors, like I said, just on one bush. And uh, in terms of fun facts about sea blight, I actually don't have any, except for the fact that it too is an edible plant. We're gonna look at one more species, and then we'll, we'll have looked at three great photographer's plants. Um, this is one I hope people have seen around the place. It's called rounded noonflower or dysphyma crassifolium. 
and it uh, it's either green or red. It could be really bright green, but it's usually red, and it grows in really poor soils. Cannot take very much flooding at all, so it's going to always be a little bit further away from the water than the sea blight. Uh, but other than that, it's basically scattered throughout the coastal landscape. And it gives us huge swathes of red um, in the Cheatham Salt, Mar the Cheatham Salt uh, Marsh area. And it's also the species that gives us this amazing spring bloom in the Altona Coastal Park. The uh, surrounded so noon flower, it actually has leaves, but they're, they're like lobes. And uh, it can turn from red to green in like a day or two. It can just, the lobes can just fill up with water after a good rain, like little water balloons. And that's because it's a succulent, as are so many of the plants in the salt marsh. They're at least a little bit succulent. Um, the noon flower, the, the lobes are almost, they have the anatomy of a water balloon. They, they have cells that can greatly expand just to hold water um, like a cactus, but not strictly as a, as a means of dealing with drought, but rather it gives the plant, having extra water in the tissue gives the plant lots of options for photosynthesizing and, and taking up nutrients and doing the things that a plant has to do in the presence of a lot of salt in the soil. And um, fun facts about um, rounded noon flower, it too is an edible plant. Um, so flooding and salt are two main factors that decide what the salt marsh looks like. Most plants in general do not handle flooding very well, but salt is actually a poison to all plants, including amazing salt marsh plants. So um, great, we've got this poison that's in the habitat, but you look around and there's things growing everywhere, coping with it just fine or not, depending on how closely you look. Because if you do look closely, you actually find there's plenty of um, examples of desolation and uh, decrepitude like this, which is a hypersaline salt flat, um, hypersaline mud flat, which it's too salty for the beaded glasswort to grow at all. And beaded glasswort can stand salinity levels way higher than seawater. Um, black seed glasswort can grow here, um, but at a really terrible cost because it uh, this species should be able to grow into a really nice little bush, but instead it's taking years or even decades, I'm not sure, just to grow a few centimeters. And parts of the plant are dying away just as quickly as other parts of the plant are trying to grow. So they end up being really sickly and twisted. Um, so I sometimes, I sometimes wonder whether we have healthy salt marsh. I'd love some scientists to come and tell us. But then I think, well, how would you even know? How, what does healthy actually mean in the salt marsh? It's kind of a philosophical question, um, which also kind of applies on the art side as well. There's a similar question. It's like, how do artists respond to a half dead landscape? And it depends on the artist, I suppose. For painters, it's really just more colors to play around with. As you can see in this really great salt marsh painting by Julie Donald, where she's just cut loose with colors and, and marks. Um, I think it's a little bit harder for photographers because, well, I know from experience, I'd rather photograph, you know, just a plain dead plant than a half dead plant. That, uh, that's tricky. It, uh, when I'm taking a picture, I want to flatter the natural landscape. If I've got a species I'm trying to picture, I'm, I'm always looking for that perfect little patch of it. Um, and maybe I shouldn't. Um, but here's an experiment of trying to do something interesting with a half dead patch of salicornia. 
um, but actually I'm kidding because it's Salicornia and Jackson Pollock. But uh, that's this half dead big expanse of Salicornia. I'm actually not sure how healthy or decrepit it is, but um, it's very interesting. It's been growing here a long time and it shows us something about the salt marsh. It, uh, if it does die out, it'll probably be from competition because growing here so long, it's, uh, it's trapped mud underneath and uh, little twigs have dropped off. So it's not flooding anymore. It's created the conditions for other species to start to grow. So coming up through the salt marsh is, um, well, there's a herb that you can't really see called Frankenia. And then something you definitely can see, which is another type of salt of a glasswort um, called shrubby glasswort, which if it keeps growing, it gets so tall compared to the beaded glasswort that it looks like a tree. And the, uh, the Latin name is Tectocornia arbuscula, which means looking like a tree. And um, you can see in the background that when it gets established, it grows up, it forms a really dense thicket, which in this case ex extends way into the distance. We uh, have a nickname for this, this big thicket. We call it the old growth forest. I'll show you where it's located in just a minute. Um, first, I'll show you this uh, close up. So that's a shrubby glasswort. You can see it, it's a glasswort, it's uh, a succulent, but it's very woody. So it gets trunks and branches, which means it can get tall. And I just mean tall means it usually comes up to your waist, sometimes up to your chest, could get up to as high as your head. But in the glasswort world, that is enormous, right? So that's like the redwood of the glass of the glasswort family. And when it becomes established after many, many years, a long period of time, it um, forms a, a forest. And this is the old growth forest, as we call it, from the air. Um, it's uh, it's such a dense thicket, uh, there's no way you can actually explore it. You can't go out in the middle of it, but we can see it's very soggy, full of ponds and channels. Um, it's located near the mouth of Laberton Creek, and you can see it's a little rectangle. It's actually not very little, but it uh, used to be much larger, and um, a lot of it's been removed. But it had, it's been here an awful long time, maybe centuries. Um, I don't know exactly what happened, probably you, uh, none of us do, but we can use our imagination. We know that um, long time ago, before European settlement, Port Phillip flooded from Point Cook all the way up to Altona, this big area, very flat. So you have this huge amount of land close to well, between high tide and low tide. And scientists think that that could have happened really quickly. So if we assume that it did, that means uh, the, you know, it, the bay came in and wiped out everything. It would have just been this huge expanse of sand and mud. But on the very edge of it, you have one thing growing, and that is beaded glasswort. And it's growing out down from the high tide line and after many, many years, it uh, builds up some soil and uh, other things can grow like the shrubby glasswort, which is even better at building up soil. So after many, many years, finally, the, uh, the bay isn't flooding in anymore. Or if it is, it's got to go through little channels through the shrubby glasswort and eventually it is, uh, it's not flooding anymore from the bay. And uh, the two species working together have basically pushed back the sea and uh, created not dry land, but have um, created this permanent salt marsh. Um, that's a bit of an oversimplification, but that's good enough for today. And um, that's the story behind that landscape. So I think that uh, I'm, Kind of coming to the end, running out of time, but uh, I'll just recap what uh, we've learned. This is a talk about art 
and science and nature and the environment. So we've learned that the salt marsh is really, really important. This is what salt marsh looks like in Australia. It's full of shrubby things, short and tall, called glasswort. And in the urban area around Melbourne, this is probably the closest thing we have to actual wilderness. Um, it's our probably largest areas of really rich biodiversity and uh, open space. So extremely important and really important to all of us as, as artists and nature lovers. The, uh, the places that you can see, well, we're lucky in Hobson's Bay. If you wanna know where you can see salt, salt marsh, there's really large areas in Williamstown and at, near the mouth of Laverton Creek, and then from there all the way to Point Cook. But most of our most important parks are along the foreshore, and they have some samples some, somewhere of these plants and of salt marsh. And you could start at Spotswood and follow the foreshore all the way around into Wyndham, all the way to Point Cook, and find really beautiful things to, to spot, photograph, um, really important bits of habitat of salt marsh. And um, in terms of getting more information, you could look for Hobson's Bay Wetland Center on the internet or the Hobson's Bay City Council website, because those are good sources of information. And I pretty much got to where I wanted to be after half an hour, but I have plenty more things we could talk about. Um, so I guess what I'm supposed to do now is ask if there's any questions. Okay, we haven't had any questions coming. If anyone's got any questions, they can pop it in the, um, the chat box down the bottom and I can ask Gordon them. But I have a couple of my own, Gordon. Um, I'm just wondering, is the glass for an endangered species at all in Hobson's Bay or is it um, wide, so widely spread that it's not, a, not in any danger? Mm. Well, that's a good question. Um, the, the species is not endangered. Um, it is actually quite, and, and even not even in Hobson's Bay, certainly not in Australia because there are really large areas of it. Um, but we're kind of in a world where everything's endangered, really. We are losing wetlands all the time, even in countries where we preserve wetlands, they're still being lost or damaged. And um, if we were say in Sydney, we'd find that uh, we'd be a little bit worse off if we wanted to see areas of salt marsh um, because even though Sydney, when it was discovered, would have been a huge salt marsh area, they really lost almost all of it. Um, in Melbourne, you wouldn't say Melbourne has lost as much because we are the custodians of a big, huge part of Melbourne's salt marsh. But that species, the that species, the beaded glasswort, that is what you find along, wherever it's protected, along the, the tide line, and there's nothing else that can grow there. So it's not endangered, no. Okay. Uh, we have another question here asking what makes the glasswort red? Well, the, um, it's, uh, I don't actually know because you can say in general that uh, salt marsh plants can very easily change colors from green to red. As you know, plants have a number of pigments in them and uh, they can still be healthy and, and carrying on cell photosynthesis even when the green isn't the most obvious pigment that you can see. Um, there's a general principle if you're a gardener and you like to grow succulents, you learn that uh, stress brings out the red. And the salt marsh is a really stressful habitat. But then when you want to ask, why is it green today and it was red last autumn? I'm not sure if those are really easy questions to answer. Um, because what goes on inside the plant at a you know, metabolic level 
it's not really well, well understood. And certainly I'm not an expert in it. So it's, uh, it's responding to stress and uh, it can be lots of different colors and still healthy if uh, you take a really broad understanding of what healthy means. Okay, thanks for that. Um, so we've got another one here asking, what other forms of biodiversity does the salt marsh support? Well, the salt marsh is a great place for, it's a great refuge for migratory birds. And we have got, uh, we've got birds visiting Hobson's Bay every year that have flown halfway around the world. So um, that's a big part of the biodiversity story in the 21st century. You've got these species that are flying from one country to another. And if we don't protect the habitats that they're stopping in and um, spending the summer in, then we lose them. I didn't talk much about the birds because uh, sometimes the birds get uh, all the talk in uh, when we give presentations. It, it, they're starting to become kind of celebrities in Hobson's Bay, which I think is great. Um, and they are really important biodiversity. However, when the birds leave and go back to the Northern Hemisphere, there's still other Australian species that are in the salt marsh that um, those big thickets of Tectocornia are full of wildlife and we, we don't really see it, so we don't realize it, but it, they really are. And then um, there are all these species like really small young fish that spend time in the salt marsh as well. And if they couldn't spend those first few months of their life cycle in salt marsh, we wouldn't have them in the bay as grown up fish that fishermen can catch. So those are other important forms of biodiversity. Thank you for that. Uh, we've got another question asking, are guided tours of the salt marsh <clears throat> offered? That's an interesting mm. one. <clears throat> well, yes, that's one of the, that's one of the things that uh, the Hobson's Bay Wetland Center does. And uh, the, uh, you're probably aware, I haven't really pointed it out, but there's a huge area of national park that is adjacent to, well, from Laverton Creek all the way down to Point Cook, it's called Cheatham Wetlands. You won't actually be able to get into the national park if you don't go on a guided tour. So uh, Council and Hobson's Way Wetland Center are places that you can contact to find out when there are tours of the national park because they don't happen very frequently. But we give tours of other parts around Hobson's Bay. And so do the other friends groups and the uh, Hobson's Bay Rangers. Okay, uh, I've got some more questions here. Uh, what will happen to your beautiful artwork? Oh, I don't know. It. Um, I guess if it was uh, up on display in the gallery, we'd have a for sale sign on it. And uh, it's unfortunate we're not going to get the chance to have it displayed because I think pictures don't do it justice. It's not the it, same as seeing it in real life, is it? It won't fit in the attic. Um, <laughs> I don't know where Sandra will allow me to to store it because storing artworks becomes an issue. Um, always has for my whole life, but uh, I don't know what will happen to it. I haven't, you know, got a good answer for that. Okay, so um, one here asking about the heart. The picture on the bottom with the boardwalks and the red, where was that taken? <laughs> that's, um, <clears throat> that's in Korea. Um, that's a, uh, I think it's called K Pong. I actually don't remember the name. It's a, it's a salt works in Korea that happens to be a, a, a tourist destination um, because the glass ward is so colorful. Um, and I threw that in because I just, I just thought it was kind of interesting for photographers. I, I go looking for pictures of, um, it's also called Samphire. So you could search online for pictures of Samphire. It can be very colorful. Sometimes photographers lean a little bit heavy on the uh, saturation filters and uh, 
you know, sometimes push it a little bit too far. Um, and that I think is what happened in this picture. But uh, it's also Salicornia, but a different kind, an Asian species. So it's like what we have here in Australia, but it's in Korea. Thank you. Okay, so this, this, this is a very broad question. What should happen to ensure salt marsh is protected and what are the greatest threats? <laughs> well, the uh, salt marsh is threatened by development, pollution, um, overuse, and sea level rise. And there are really good developments all around the world in terms of <clears throat> community awareness and government protection and international treaties. Um, but uh, I think what we really need to do to protect them is first of all, to learn more about them because you can't really protect something when you don't understand what's happening and what could happen. And so we need to continue to research it and learn about it and, um, and have a com an engaged community so that we can actually respond. It's really kind of difficult to know what will, the place where we live will be like 20, 30 years from now. So I don't know what the answer is, but the, the starting point, the fundamentals are, is that we have to actually learn and, and be engaged and care. Is there any ongoing studies happening down at the, um, the wetlands around here? From like yes. universities perhaps or things? Yes, there are, um, there's like increased interest in salt marsh. Um, one of the uh, most interesting and leading groups in Australia is Deakin University. And they specifically, they do exactly what I was saying. Study the salt marsh to understand what's happening. And uh, they have lots of places that they can study salt marsh. There's a lot of salt marsh in Victoria, but we actually also have specifically studies by Deakin University and by the Hobson's Bay Wetland Center going on in Hobson's Bay salt marsh. And is that something that's available to members of the public to find out information about? Is that through the wetlands? Themselves? Absolutely. Um, we have information about that. It's not just something where the public is, um, where it's available to the public. It actually needs the public. Um, the, uh, the study that started um, with Blue Carbon Lab down at, uh, which is the Deakin University um, laboratory that studies salt marsh, they uh, installed a field experiment that wouldn't have really been feasible without a lot of volunteers. I think it was about 12 months ago that we started it. So that's, that's citizen science. That's uh, people helping to um, <clears throat> make some of these research programs possible. Okay, so does that mean the Wetland Centre is looking for volunteers continuously or? Uh, yes, we are. We um, are open to it. We're coming in. We're volunteering is really important to us. Um, it's not just uh, it's it's great for volunteers and it's great for the environment. And uh, we we're doing so many things at once. You might not that might not be coming through as one of our key messages. But absolutely, yep. Okay, so we've got one last question here. Is is glassfort and samphire the same thing? It's the same thing. Yep. Just two different, really old names for it. Okay, and I have I have one last question of myself. You said you could eat the plants. <laughs> is that um? <laughs> is that just you just pick them and eat them, or is, do they have to be prepared? Look at this. So not only, not only are they edible, they're like gourmet edible. Um, I, don't know, <clears throat> I don't know how you eat, say, uh, rounded noon flour. If you reach down on the ground and picked it up and nibbled on it, it's actually, it spit it out. But um, they, they're fundamentally edible. They would have uh, been food sources uh, for thousands of years for indigenous people. And uh, the... Uh, some of the recipes for the glass work go back to the Middle Ages. Some of the other things are just sort of nouveau cuisine experimenting. Okay. 
So we don't have any other, oh, hang on, now we've got another question coming. Oh, no, we don't. Oh, yeah. Is glass water and sam, oh, no. Do Italians do samphire as a treat dish or as a comment? <laughs> and someone else saying maybe as a salty garnish. <laughs> uh, so that, that's the end. We don't have any other questions come in at the moment. Is there anything else you'd like to spend a few minutes talking about, Gordon? Is that putting um, you on the spot? Because we've still got 15 minutes to go. 15 minutes to go. Well, the uh, that's Williamstown, and that's um, that's Altona Meadows. I uh, I mean I love this this idea of looking at where we live from above and the places that we're studying, and uh, I realized I couldn't cover all this in a half hour, but since we have a few minutes, I'll show these pictures. That's Google Earth looking down on the uh, the salt marsh in, well, this is actually covers Hobson's Bay and Wyndham, this picture. And if you just, if you know the area, it'd be fine. Otherwise, you might need a little bit of help. That's Queen Street going from Altona into Altona Meadows, and that's Laverton Creek. And this is the area I was talking about. This whole area, it's all very heavily modified now. It was really changed in the 20th century when Cheatham Salt started building dikes and everything through it. But um, this was all probably flooded once, probably reclaimed by salt marsh. The, uh, the thing is though, the natural movement of sand would really deserves a huge amount of credit for what happened. Um, if you, you know, if you look at here, um, there's an arrow. That is, that's the salt, that's the sand spit that's now at the mouth of Laverton Creek. And you can see it's this feathery shape and behind it is a lagoon, all this green, a really rich and protected lagoon. So sand spits would have come and gone for centuries. So if you look, what's this? You know, this is another feathery shape, but that's, that's really old. And somehow it got fossilized into the salt marsh. But if you look, you'll probably can see even more. So we've got uh, the salt marsh being protected by the sand spits. And instead of just one sort of march, one sort of progression of salt marsh taking over, it's more like a chess game, right? With give and take taking centuries. Um, <clears throat> but that's what creates the really interesting natural forms and patterns that we, we really appreciate either as artists or as scientists. I've just got a question on that slide, um, Gordon. Someone's just asking what's the other creek that's in this picture? Okay, that one there, I think you can see my cursor, right? If I do that, yeah, yeah. that's Laberton Creek. That was dug by bulldozers. This is Skeleton Creek, which is a natural creek. Um, the uh, Skeleton Creek always reached the sea. It's probably been straightened and whatnot. And it uh, comes from way inland off the, the lava flow, the ancient lava flows and winds down and then eventually comes out here. And it would have gone that way at one time and gone that way at another time. You can kind of use your imagination and see what the natural kind of pattern is there. Uh, we've got someone else asking, um, why is the Hobson's Bay salt marsh internationally significant? Well, we, uh, <clears throat> we have birds landing here and it'll be happening right about now. It happens this time of year that have flown all the way from Alaska and Siberia. And they need, they're going to spend the entire southern summer here and they need to feed here and build up enough energy so that they can fly back. And when they fly back, that's where they will actually reproduce in the northern hemisphere. So really any place that they stop along the way is internationally significant because if we don't have it, that species can't survive. And it's not just one species. There are 
Um, well, there's actually dozens of species. I won't say you find dozens in Hobson's Bay. We have a handful of species. They get to Australia and each species finds its favorite place to stop. And red neck stints and uh, godwits and sharp-tailed sandpipers and green shanks, they like to come all the way down to us or even to Tasmania. So we are tied by that species to the Northern Hemisphere. Um, that's probably the main reason, but they are, like, like you know, I pointed out there are old areas of uh, old Tectocornia, which take, you know, that could be centuries old, that old growth forest. Quite a few reasons why they're significant. Okay, and um, we've got, um, Kelly's asking why was Laverton Creek dug? That, uh, <clears throat> okay, so I know Jared Morell is listening, so I better try to be as accurate as possible. <laughs> it uh, was dug to facilitate drainage as this area developed, because just off the screen here is another really great wetlands area that I just didn't manage to get in this, in this view, which is also quite large, and that is the Truganina wetlands and it uh, wouldn't have had this really big broad connection to the sea but it was still a wetlands it still is and it would flood and uh, in order to reduce the risk of that flooding to uh, to the surrounding Altona somebody decided we needed this big wide creek to come out. Has that impacted the wetlands over there negatively having that? That certainly changed the flood regime, which in turn changes the salinity. So yes, it has impacted. Um, however, it uh, it's one of it's one of the areas that's protected and actually really actively managed by Melbourne Water. So it has the benefit of being taken care of. Okay. Uh, okay. So there was that's the last of the questions we've got there on that. So, um, so is there anything else you'd like to say or would we can pack it up a little bit early if that's... Um, well, no, I've got more slides. Um, well, if you're happy to keep talking for the, another, the last 10 minutes, that would be really this, cool. This is a great story, right? This whole um, view, it actually, takes a little bit of time to explain it, but we've half explained it, and I'm not an expert either, um, but there are things that we can all, we can all notice. The, uh, this area has this long history of salt marsh growth, fresh water flowing through it, sand spits, and it's easy to see from the air. But once you've seen it from the air and you've had it explained to you, you can actually go and see if you can actually see these patterns from the ground. And uh, this is, this sign here, I think, helps tell the story. This shows you the change over time because when the National Park was created in the 90s, this was on the beach, telling people that there's a National Park here. Um, underneath Cheatham wetlands, there's this layer of mud, which is actually peat soil from centuries of salt marsh. And I have a pretty strong hunch that that's what's underneath this sign, like down under. So all around this sign would have been um, salt marsh a long time ago. Um, but then Port Phillip came in and eroded away everything to the left side of the sign. So that's all bay. And then sand washed up and blew up to the right hand side of the sign replacing the salt marsh with sand dunes and then coastal grasslands. And then they put the sign in. And then you had a new sand deposit way out to the left. But of course, that's the spit. And that's like shape, that's a feathery shape. And there's flooded areas behind it, right? These, you know, feathery shape with these long little bites. So that's habitat for the salt marsh to come back. 
and which is what you see here, the salicornia, but then you also have the shrubby glassworts starting to grow. And eventually it will be full cycle. So it's that give and take, it's that chess game. And you can see it from the air. And you can also, if you're really observant, you can understand it and see it from ground level. Okay. We've had, we've had someone just ask, um, what's the difference between salt marsh and wetlands? Well, salt marsh is a, a type of wetlands. The wetlands refers to any area that's uh, where its natural history is affected by regular flooding. And it could be really irregular. It could just be once a decade or, or even once a century. But it is uh, somehow, it's sometimes wet. Salt marsh has got salt in the soil. And that means there's far fewer species that can survive there because salt, like we said, is a poison. But salt marsh is a wetland. Okay, thank you. Um, so we might wrap it up there if that's all right. And thank you, Gordon, for your very interesting talk. Uh, doesn't seem to be any more questions from anyone coming in. But, okay, um, well, thank you. It was a lot of fun. I really appreciated you coming in and I hope everyone's um, enjoyed themselves today listening to you so the recording we will probably make the recording um available we'll definitely make it available somewhere and we'll let people know where that will be and you're getting lots of comments coming in saying thank you and it's how interesting it is the artist's perspective on the wetlands okay great well it was a lot of fun it probably would have been a lot more fun to have it uh at the Louis Joel Center, because that's always a really great venue um, for bringing the community together. Um, but it wasn't to be, was it? Well, we've just actually, can I just say, we've had one ask to have a final look at your painting. So is that, are you oh. able to call that up so people can have a, have a look? Yeah, we'll go back. <laughs> we'll go back the hard way. Because I'd, don't know. I will let people know this that this image is actually the wetland centre have um, let us put this image on a postcard that was, is going to be coming out from them, which will be sent to every participant. So you will get a copy of this in, in a very small form in your habitat box when we send it out to you. Thank so you, Lynn. I'll, I'll say thank you to Gordon again and um, Thank you to everyone who attended and we'll leave it there. Bye. All right, see you. <laughs> uh, okay, everyone's just slowly leaving. That was really good, Gordon. I really enjoyed that personally. Okay, thank you. Okay. I won't leave. I'll be the last person to leave. I think that's polite. Yeah, there was just still got a couple of still still there, but there's lots there's lots of comments coming. You wish you could see the comments in the chat, probably that people have uh, maybe I can. good feedback for you. I don't think I'm meant to leave yet. That would be rude. <laughs> that was excellent. That was so good. We went out there. I'm just going to figure out how to stop the recording.